More than six months ago, I modded the shunt resistors of the RTX 2070 mobile in my laptop. I used the 4 milliohm shunt resistor instead of the original 5 milliohm resistor to come in at nearly 140 watts TGP. But with the higher power draw, I had to cool down the components better than stock. Not just the GPU, but also the VRMs. Because of that, I modified the heatsink and was able to improve the VRM temperature significantly. The final step I want to talk about in this part of the laptop modding adventure is nickel plating and liquid metal. And this is the end result. Compared to the original copper heatsink, the silverish look is pretty apparent. But it's not just the looks. After using it daily ever since, with a lot of transportation between home and work, I can finally say it works great. So let's talk about what was necessary to nickel plate it, what I've paid for and what the benefits and risks are when you want to use liquid metal. Let's go through the whole process step by step to answer those questions. Step 1. Preparing the heatsink. The reason for all this work was my goal to decrease the temperatures as much as possible. An important part of this is a good die contact, which was not always guaranteed with the original heatsink design. The CPU's contact area looks very uneven and the GPU's counter pressure is too high. To increase the GPU pressure, I had the idea to send down the video memory's copper plates a bit to reduce the counter pressure from the thermal pads and allow higher pressure on the GPU die this way. In the end, I managed to send off 0.1 mm. Next was the CPU contact area, at which I used a small glass body and sandpaper to make it more flat. This area is surrounded by small copper walls, which make the sanding job in this area a nightmare, but still manageable. Now, if you want to apply a nickel layer to your heatsink, it needs to be super clean. That means you have to remove all stickers and other residues which are not copper or solder. If you miss some spots you will see some defects after the nickel plating is done. Like those ones for example. Oh, and just because commercial nickel plated heat sinks are shiny and got a mirror like finish does not automatically mean that the nickel layer is responsible for that. If you want a shiny surface finish, the actual copper needs to be shiny before the nickel plating comes into play. To make my copper heatsink a bit more shiny, after the rough handling, as you can see in part 3 for example, I use the Dremel. At first I tried to achieve a mirror-like finish with the polishing tool, but I quickly realized that it's way too much hassle and I would never reach all spots, so the end result would look quite stupid with its mixed rough and mirror-like surface. In the end I discovered that this polishing brush creates a good enough finish for my needs. Step 2. Nickel plating. If you are like me and want the nickel layer to be robust and long-lasting, consider to let it be done professionally. You can do it yourself, of course, but it can go wrong, as the Bauer showed impressively. Sorry, Roman. Check out this video if you have not done so already. Link in the video description. I might try to do it myself in a follow-up video too, but for the beginning I brought it to a company close to me. The whole process takes several steps. At first the heatsink gets washed in a heated soap tank, rinsed with clear water, then gets cleaned in another soap tank with a small additional electric current and gets rinsed again. Next is a tank which contains an activator, which is different for every material we want to nickel plate. In our case we got a copper heatsink, which needs palladium chloride to prepare the copper surface for the plating process, to make it catalytic to the process so to say. Otherwise, the nickel would not be able to bond with the copper surface appropriately. After this step, the part will get rinsed with clear water again. And finally, the part needs to stay in a hot, phosphorus nickel solution for about 30 to 60 minutes. The longer the part stays in, the thicker the nickel layer gets. In my case, the heatsink stayed in this bath for around 40 minutes, which should give me a nickel layer thickness of 15 micrometers which was the most common value for heatsinks I found in the internet. And the best part about all the hassle, it costed me only 32 euros. Nothing to regret, the end result looks awesome. By the way, there are two methods to nickel blade apart. You can do it by electro and electro-less blading. What I just described to you is electro-less blading, which means 
there was no electric current involved in the actual plating process. Commercial products usually use electroless plating too, because it's easier to do in masses and creates a very robust, consistent layer with even thickness. Electroplating, on the other hand, allows to apply nickel more concentrated on spots and the bolt process is a lot faster. But it tends to form layers of uneven thickness because the nickel atoms tend to concentrate on edges instead of the whole area evenly. Step 3. Protect your hardware from the dangers of liquid metal. Liquid metal is conducting electricity and it is very, very risky. If not applied correctly, it can easily form drops and move around in your computer, where it can eventually short out components and possibly damage your hardware. To prevent that, we have to make sure the liquid metal can't leave its place. As seen with some commercial products, we can try to create a barrier around the CPU and GPU die. The perfect solution for my do-it-yourself attempt should be soft and temperature-resistant foam. I found some for acoustic dampening applications, which met the criteria. I just needed to cut it down to an appropriate shape and thickness and I was ready to go. It may not look awesome, but it should work as intended. But as you may notice, the foam does not cover all spots on the GPU die. Some components are still in danger to become shorted in case the liquid metal spills out. The answer to the problem is a protective coating layer to electrically isolate the little capacitors. I know there's a product out there which is made for this use case specifically, but to be honest, who think red is a good color for that? And what about a favorite of the do-it-yourself community, nail polish? Well, I don't think most of the stuff is made for high temperature applications in technical devices. So who tells me the stuff will hold up over several years? Now I had a little chat with a friend of mine and he recommended conformal coating for PCBs. This stuff is made to protect PCB components, resist high temperatures and should be long lasting too. So sounds perfect, doesn't it? Unfortunately I had found clear conformal coating only. This stuff surely works, but the transparent looks drives me nuts. My eyes can still see the solar joints, so how do I know they are truly isolated? Eventually I hope I should not be too worried about that. After three layers it got to be isolated perfectly according to the product description. So I applied five layers. So let's go on with step four. We install the heatsink with liquid metal. Now that I got the foam, the isolating conformal coating and the protective nickel plating on my heatsink, everything is prepared for liquid metal. It shouldn't short anything and it should not be able to mitigate into the heatsink's copper and dry out, so to say. It should stay where it is and keep its properties even after years of use. And step 5, enjoy the results. And the results speak for themselves. Compared to the thermal paste, the temperatures improved significantly. It looks like the thermal bond is a lot better, which helps to transfer the heat from the GPU into the heatsink more efficient. The CPU temperatures show a big improvement too, although the liquid metal is applied to the IHS instead of a CPU die directly. It's a bit hard to judge how much influence the leveling with the glass body and sandpaper at the CPU contact area got. The liquid metal alone should make up the majority of the improvements though. The raised power draw and the better cooling allows the GPU to perform better in the long run, as we can see in this plot. You are looking at the GPU core clock speed and as you can see the clocks stay higher and do not drop off as much over time. In case you don't know, this comes from the behavior of the GPU to throttle itself gradually when it becomes warmer. The cooler you keep your modern GPU, the higher the clocks and FPS will be. The throttling starts to become really heavy at a certain point, which is usually at around 87 degrees centigrade. This ultimately means short benchmark runs, as seen with time spy, do not tell you much about the long term performance. In this plot, the time spy scores of both the thermal paste and liquid metal runs are nearly identical. But in a longer time spy stress test, you can see some clear performance benefits after just 5 minutes on a full load.
This data from Cyberpunk 2077 shows an even higher difference, which becomes also visible in the average FPS. All in all, the shunt mod for nearly 140 watts TGP combined with the nickel plating and liquid metal should provide roughly the same temperature and noise levels as the stock laptop does, but at a higher performance level. The performance increased by 4% in TimeSpy and 6% in Cyberpunk 2077. Well, to be honest, this little improvement is definitely not worth the work all the modding steps require. But it was also a lot of fun. Oh, and if you might ask if these mods are even stable for daily use, then I can happily report that they are. I'm using this machine with all the Sean mods since 6 months now. I transferred it to work back and home daily and game on it in the evening for at least 2 hours daily. So there are no stability issues so far and the temperature and performance is still great. That's it for this video and if you may or may not want to see more modding content consider to subscribe to my channel. Maybe there is some more to discover, let's see. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one, bye.